introduction to some of the key things that sociologists think about when they're studying education. If you're interested in this topic, I recommend taking Professor Weininger's class. It's a, I think it's a 400 level class, but he is one of the foremost authorities on education from a sociological perspective in the United States. I would say he's one of the big names. Annette Leroux, who talks about parenting, is one of the big names uh, that you read earlier in the semester. Seamus Khan, uh, a famous sociologist who works at, I believe it is Columbia right now. He has a book called Privilege, which is quite good on the role of private schools. But Professor Weininger is one of the great people uh, in, in the field. So if you're interested in this topic, if you're going into education, if you're just curious about the roles of different types of schools in society, highly recommend that upper level sociology class. For next time, on Thursday, you, will be ha you have two short readings. One is Hidden Brain, How a Theory of Crime and Policing Was Born and Went Terribly Wrong. If you go to this, you can also listen to it as a podcast, so that's an option, but you don't have to. And then Eric Kleinenberg, which is probably the more important of the two readings, uh, do them both. But Eric Kleinenberg, who you read before, wrote Adaptation, wrote Going Solo. Uh, he has something called The Other Side of Broken Windows. So we're going to talk briefly about this on Thursday, but then we're going to use it again the following week. Now, what we're going to talk about today builds on our discussion of spatial segregation and natural disasters that we introduced through the video that you watched, or the documentary, I should say, and our class discussion last time. I'm going to talk a little bit about education, and then you have this podcast that you're listening to on your own, which relates directly to not only education, but also the history of spatial segregation in the United States. As you listen to the podcast, one of the things you should pay attention to is where are these schools that are being discussed actually located? You could just enter this into Google Maps and see. It's about a 36 minute drive. Uh, I think it says, what is that? Uh, 28 miles. And it's going to perfectly map on to all those redlining maps that I showed you, uh, showed you an example of with Cleveland and that you uh, learned about in the documentary. It's going to map perfectly onto that exact same pattern. If you want to know about the inequality, if you want to know about how some of the schools has less funding than other schools, how some schools have lower pay for teachers than other schools, how there's a degree of uh, isolation and lowered expectations. It's all about that history of spatial segregation that we talked about. Now, in sociology as a whole, the basic thing that people really explore is how do schools both serve, and this is a paradox because it does both of these things, right? School is supposed to be this institution in society that provides equal opportunity. That provides a chance for people to lift them up by the bootstraps. If they work really hard, they can move on to a good college, and that will provide the path to uh, being a middle in the middle class or the upper class or even wealthy, right? So it's a place of incredible op opportunity. It's a place of equal opportunity but incredible opportunity. But then at the same time, and this is the paradox, schools often end up as a sorting and stratifying. They end up sorting and stratifying students by the backgrounds from which they came. Right? They end up reproducing the place that you began, even as they're supposed to be this meritocratic institution where if you work hard and put, and put energy into it, then you can move up the ladder. Right? So how is it that they do both? That's what, that's what sociologists often study. There's lots of different ways to study it. There's macro studies, there's meso-level studies, there's micro studies. But a lot of the work is trying to understand how is it that this place of opportunity can also be a place of intense stratification and intense reproduction. Sometimes we talk about this within schools, but it's even greater process between schools. But if we're talking about education, again, a good place to start is simply saying, what do we mean by this term? The textbook definition is education is the process through which academic, social, and cultural ideas and tools are developed. This probably isn't that surprising. It's a place where you learn things, right? And what type of stuff do you learn? Well, they can be more academic, they can be social skills, they can be cultural skills, and you can develop tools to utilize all those things. It could be an intellectual tool like math, right? Math could be considered a tool, or it could be actually technology. This is one of the most dominant social institutions, right? I told you about the different social institutions that exist within our society, something like religion, something like family, something like media. All of them have a lot of power, Education is incredibly powerful simply because of the amount of time you spend there. By the time you finish your degree at Brockport, a lot of you have will spent as much time in the education system as you have with close family members, as you have with close friends, right? We simply spend a lot of time there. And not only do you have to spend a lot of time there, do you spend a lot of time there, but it's required, right? You can't simply not go to school. When you're 10 years old, 
Education is compulsory. Is compulsory. That's part of what it means to be in society. To get out of it, you have to have your parents go through a difficult process or your guardian go through a difficult process of getting you permission to be homeschooled. Then the question becomes, we've all been through the educational system, right? At least to some extent. What kind of things do you learn? And as you think about that, maybe even pause the video and think about that. What type of stuff do you learn? You're probably going to come up with examples that match some of the manifest functions and latent functions of education. Now I'm going to come back to those two terms. If you're thinking about terms that you need to remember, manifest is one of them, latent is one of them. But let's think about it. So what are the main functions of schools? The first one, the obvious one, is to educate students, right? So what do you actually get educated in? Well, you need to learn things like reading, writing, arithmetic, all those basic skills that if you listed what you have to be learn in school, what you have to be tested on, these are the things that we'd come up with. You're also learning a lot of skills that are needed specifically for the workplace. And we're going to think about what type of skills that includes, but when, we're, when you're referring to all the type of knowledge and skills that help you get a job, that help you uh, the, uh, the, that help you succeed in the job, that help you in a way to produce for society and make money for yourself, what we refer to that as is human capital. So when we say human capital, how much human capital do you have? It's all those type of skills that can make you successful in the workplace, that can make you successful in society. Those include those general skills. It also includes very more refined and specific skills. The other thing that it does beyond just those general skills, reading, writing, arithmetic, learning how to follow a schedule, uh, learning how to interact with other people. And we'll talk about that type of stuff, uh, what term we use for that in a, in a little bit. Um, what else? Uh, learning how to work in a group. All those things would be considered human capital. It also socializes you on a very basic level. This is one of the main functions of schooling. It's not just about teaching you how to do math. It's not just teaching you how to locate a country on the globe or on a map. It's also transmitting values and beliefs and attitudes that we see as in being important to society. It's teaching you to be able to sit in a chair and pay attention. It's teaching you to be able to focus on a task. It's teaching you to be able to respect and to not only be able to, but to internalize the idea that you're supposed to respect authority, that you're supposed to listen, that you're supposed to ask to go to the bathroom that you're supposed to sit with your hands folded and not be distracted. All those things are, are still part of the functions of schooling. All those things are skills that you need to learn to be good a good labor force, right? Think about it. A lot of school, a lot of schools, a lot of the curriculum was developed a time where during a time where most people would end up working in a factory, would end up working these assembly line jobs. Well, you need these type of skills to be able to do that. You need to be socialized in a very particular way. All right, so let's get back to these terms, the manifest and latent. The transmission of knowledge is the manifest function. The obvious parts of education, that reading, writing, math, and so on that I mentioned before. The obvious parts are the manifest aspects of education. The other not so obvious ones are the latent functions. Right, that stuff I said about following social rules, respecting authorities, authority, being able to interact with other people, uh, all those things that make us efficient and obedient workers and, and productive in society, those are the latent functions. So the manifest ones are the goals that are listed on the class syllabus, the things that you're tested on. The latent ones are all the things that aren't listed, but they're still really important to, uh, to the, basically to the system. Sociologists have long been interested in the hidden curriculum all those latent functions of education, which I just discussed, right? All those things like obedience to authority, strict adher adherence to norms, all those things that aren't listed, they often play a huge role in reinforcing and, re and reproducing the conditions of society and reproducing and reinforcing some of the inequalities in society, right? So we have to pay attention, not, not, attention, not just to the manifest rules, not just to the manifest goals, but also all those latent things and asking what are they accomplishing and how are they passed down and how do teachers know that's important to, to spread those ideas. If we think of the most critical perspective on schooling, some sociologists treat education schools simply as sorting machines that place students into programs and, gr and groups according to their skills, interests, and talents. But if we're critical, we're saying it's not based solely on merit. 
and that it ultimately serves to reproduce social inequalities. You take students who might not be as well prepared for school based on the background that they come from, and you place them on a path to end up in that exact same position. And it's clear that while education does probably on some level benefit every single person who takes part in it, right? If you just improve some basic math or reading skills, it is doing something for you. If you learn how to interact, interact with people, it is doing something for you. But unfortunately, it doesn't benefit everyone equally. Next week, week we're going to come back to this concept of labeling more. But one thing I want you to consider is, do you support the idea of tracking and why? So tracking is this process that's intended to tailor a student's educational experience more directly to their talents and goals. And you do it by dividing students into different classes according to their ability or potentially their future plans, right? So you have the honor students, you have the regular traditional students, you have the dropout prevention students or low performing students, um, upper level, you still have the advanced placement students. Um, students who get into specific programs, maybe where they get to travel and have different experiences, the Washington program or something like that. But once you're placed in one of those tracks, it's incredibly difficult, if not impossible, to change tracks. This should remind you of the Matthew effect that we talked about earlier, right? So in practice, tracking has a number of negative effects. It definitely helps people get in that upper path, and I have some really good readings on that if you're interested. But when you get in that lower path, you're kind of stuck there. It's that self-fulfilling prophecy, that term I introduced before from Robert Merton, that mid-century sociologist. It's that process when behavior is modified to meet pre-existing expectations. If the teachers have a particular view of you and every student in the class has a particular view of you, you're probably not going to push beyond it. That's probably what you're going to work for. And it's been shown over and over in studies of education that teachers can influence student performance through the expectations that they set and their choice of instructional method. If a student, if, 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 a, if a teacher has a view that a low achieving student is going to continually prefer, perform in a low achieving manner, they're going to have, that's going to happen. However, if you place a low achieving student in a classroom with mostly high achieving students, even if at they're at the bottom of that group, they're still going to perform a lot better than they did if they were in the other class where their expectations were lower. Um, now, it does depend on how the teacher interacts. There's a lot of variables, but that's one of just those general things that students find, uh, that studies find. Um, let's, uh, let's go on a little bit. I want to get through this so you don't have to spend too much time on it. Um, and then this raises a question that I raised before when we were talking about the hockey example. What's actually the purpose, the hockey example from, from Malcolm Gladwell? The question is, as a society, what is our actual goal? What are we trying to accomplish with ed education? Is the goal simply to take those talented people and try to maximize 100% of their talent, right? Maximize whatever we can get out of that group? Or is it trying to provide the greatest opportunity for all? And can you do both? Right now, a lot of schools are showing that you can't. Now, this isn't necessarily true, but the way our system is designed tends to, uh, we struggle to do both of these things at the same time, right? Things like tracking are designed to meet number one. What are some of the trends in higher education? This is, this is a, again, just part of the short overview. If you're interested in type, this type of stuff, definitely take more sociology courses where we talk about education. Um, sociology of Institutions, which is a 200-level course, also does a good job introducing some of these trends and concepts. Um, one of the dominant trends, 1910, 3% of men and women over the age of 25 had a college degree. In 2004, 28% of men and women over the age of 25 had a college degree. So first thing we're seeing is a lot more people are getting a degree across the gender spectrum, right? More people are simply going to college and getting a degree. But the other thing that we're seeing is if you look at this chart, right, it used to be a lot more men than women were getting college degrees that shifted pretty rapidly, right? By 1970, we already saw more women than men getting a degree. Now, if we control for the type of degrees, if we control for the moving into majors where you're more likely to make more money immediately out of college, this pattern shifts. But just based on how many people are getting a degree, as early as 1970, we saw more women than men. All right, and this is another way we can see this becoming more extreme. By um, this is this was an old chart. I should have grabbed the new one. Um, this was the the first one that I could found that really illustrated this really clearly. But you could see huge disparity where 
going back, we saw that shift in the 70s to 80s, more women getting degrees than men. Now, if we look at this pattern. As a result of everyone, not everyone, as a result of more people getting college degrees, what we see is the process of, of credentialism happening. What credentialism means is that the focus becomes everyone getting the credential, even if it even if it isn't about the skills that you need for the job, people simply want you to have that degree. Now, if more and more people are getting those degrees, right, we see that happening, employers start to upgrade the requirement in order to weed out more people. As a result, people have to be in school longer, have more debt, just to get the job that they wouldn't have needed those many degrees for in the past. You often hear that a college degree now is the equivalent of a high school degree in 1950. A master's degree is, a, is the equivalent of an undergraduate degree in 1950, right? That's the process of credentialism. More training for the same type of job. The other question that sociologists ask is, do schools actually matter? What can they actually do? And this is one of those areas where the studies don't always back up each other. It depends on when the study was conducted, what schools were included, uh, what method was being used. This is still up in the air exactly what schools can do how can, how, and how schools can do a better job. But there's a few things that have been found, right? One thing that was found by uh, a famous, um, I can't remember if he was a sociologist or maybe he was an expert in education. I think he was a sociologist, but he wrote the Coleman Report. And one of the things that he found was simply that family background matters a lot and your peers matter a lot, just as much as the school that you're part of, right? The school resources are going to have an effect, but depending on who your family is, that's going to set you up to be in a better situation considering the Matthew effect, but it's also about who you're surrounded by, which is the interesting part. So it's not just what family you come from, but it's who the peer group, who's in those actually classes with you, who your friends are that can predict how well you're going to do in school. Those things often are synonymous because wealthier people often go to school with other wealthy people, right? So it ends up kind of combining, but if you separate the two out, peers have a huge impact. In the 1980s and 1990s, more studies were done, and one of the things they found was, okay, so th that stuff is true that Coleman found, but smaller classes have the potential to mitigate that effect. If you're in a small class, then you can have that positive impact on student performance that can overcome those other factors. And so you can even think about this yourself. How did your family background affect your relationship to school? How did your friend group and the people in those classes affect your relationship to school? How big were your classes? Might smaller classes have helped and why? The other thing that's been found repeatedly, and Malcolm Gladwell has a great chapter in Outliers, which I believe I have in the readings folder. So if you want to take a look at this, you can. But what Malcolm Gladwell finds is that the place, or what, he doesn't find this, but he looks at studies that found this, but the place where we see that achievement gap happening where disadvantaged students fall further behind more privileged students is often during the summer, right? And this happens between, especially between first and fifth grade. Every summer, it gets more and more intense, where during the school year, you see a lot of the same advances, but then during the summer, that stops. And why is that? We can think about the different types of parenting, right? That's part of the reason. With concerted cultivation, the kids are probably getting involved in different types of programs. Maybe going to a summer camp that's supposed to foster a, a positive relationship with education. Maybe getting in some sort of reading group or getting in some sort of organized activity. Versus with natural growth, if you're just entertaining yourself and running around during the summer playing video games, those type of things, it's not that you're losing skills, but you're definitely not advancing the skills that help you in the educational context. Um, I'm going to stop there. Uh, we can pick this up next class. I don't want to go on too far. I want to have a chance for you to talk about the podcast that you have to listen to, right? The problem we all live with. And I'll send you that link once again. Um, so listen to the podcast, complete the worksheet, and we will talk on Thursday.